So sedimentary rocks. So their name is pretty self-explanatory, uh, sedimentary rocks, in that they are rocks that are composed of sediment. Uh, but what is sediment? Sediment is the unconsolidated particles. Um, they could be either pieces of rock that are created by weather, weathering and erosion, like sand, gravel, or mud. They could be uh, dissolved minerals in water. So when you think of the salt dissolved in the ocean, uh, in the water, that is considered to be sediment. Or they could be the secretions or remains of organisms. Uh, think of shells from clams or oysters um, and so forth. Uh, and these, these sediments, they're transported across Earth's surface by water, wind, and glaciers. So the particles of, of rock that are considered to be sediment, we categorize them by size. Uh, they have specific names, like as you can see in this table, like boulder, cobble, pebble, granule, sand, silt, and clay. But we kind of break them into three general areas. The larger materials, the larger particles, are known as gravel. And then we uh, know sand. Everyone's familiar with what sand is. And mud is really fine, tiny particles. That's mud. It's also known as silt and clay. Make up mud. We have sand, and then we have boulders, cobbles, pebbles, and granules. Compose what we call gravel. Now, sediment is at least the particles of, of rock. That type of sediment is produced by the weathering of rock. What the what 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 weathering is is the breakdown of rock. A rock can be broken down in two different ways. Uh, that's mechanical weathering and chemical weathering. So mechanical weathering is the physical breakdown of rock. So rock is being physically broken into smaller pieces. So this weathering produces gravel, sand, and mud. Um, and the mechanisms that uh, produce mechanical weathering are rain, wind, so the rain and the wind wearing on rock, breaking it down, ice, so water gets into a crack, and then the water freezes, and the water freezes, it expands, it heaves the crack open wider, and it melts, freezes, and more water goes in the crack, because now it's bigger, and that water freezes, it expands again, wedges the crack open even wider. It's called a freeze-thaw cycle that helps weather, mechanically weather rock. Also vegetation, so the probing roots of plants going down into cracks as they grow wider and larger, they heave cracks open and break chunks of rock off. So that's mechanical weathering. Chemical weathering, on the other hand, is the chemical breakdown of rock. So this occurs by water dissolving rock, so the minerals that compose a rock dissolving into the water, and also acids um, in the water. You hear of acid rain, right? So that's carbon dioxide, usually dissolves in, into rain water or sulfur dioxide, and it goes create carbonic and sulfuric acid respectively, but you know, there's, there is some small amounts of acids in water, and the acid helps break down rock, chemically weathering it as well. So that's how weather, uh, sediment is produced, through weathering. Now, most weathering occurs uh, to rock that's exposed at the surface. So when, when uh, rock is exposed at the surface, we call that an outcrop. So an outcrop is never the bedrock, which are these large extensive units of rock uh, on Earth. Uh, whenever that bedrock is exposed to the surface, we have an outcrop, and that's where most weathering occurs. In this figure here, you can see this rock here is exposed. That URL keeps on coming up. Where the uh, uh, this rock is exposed, and what's happening is it's being broken down into sediment. And that's what all this down here is. This is all sediment. That sediment is coming from this outcrop right here, this exposed bedrock. You can actually see some of the vegetation growing on right there, which is aiding in the mechanical weathering. So this is normally where I ask the question to the class. Um, and we look at this image. We see these 
image with three different locations labeled with letters. So we have this mountainous area labeled A, this slope, this material and the slope uh, right here labeled B, and then this uh, stream channel, stream bed labeled C. And the question is, is at what location are the most sediments originally created? So the question is, where are the most sediments originally created? You have to ask yourself, well, what does it mean for sediments to be created? What creates sediment? Well, that's weathering. Weathering creates sediment. So this question is asking, at what location is the most bedrock being weathered? Now, if we uh, think about the last slide we talked about, where does most, where is, when is bedrock weathered? When it is exposed, okay? So rock weathers when it is exposed at the surface. So this is asking where is the most weathering occurring? To answer that question, we have to ask a supplemental question, where is the bedrock exposed? And my guess, the answer is A. So up here at A, in this mountainous area, the bedrock is exposed. So it's being, it's exposed to the elements, to the wind, to the precipitation, to ice, like glaciers grinding against the rock. And um, that's all weathering the rock, generating sediment. And that sediment is then transported from where it's being weathered to lower elevation where it's deposited. So sediment from all over here is being transferred. So this is actually a bunch of sediment being deposited here. And this is all sediment too. So the rock at locations B and C, there's actually not a lot of weathering there because the rock isn't exposed at the surface. The bedrock is buried under the sediment that's being deposited over top of it. So there's very little weathering occurring there. So most of the weathering is occurring at high elevation. And that's, that's in general, uh, true that most weathering occurs at high elevations so the highest point of elevation doesn't have to be a giant mountain like we see here just be a relatively high point of elevation higher points of elevation that's where the most weathering occurs so <clears throat> once sediment is produced through the process of weathering it's usually always transported from that point of origin the bedrock it was weathered from to some other location that's a lower elevation. And that process of the transport of sediment is known as erosion. Okay, so, so weathering and erosion are not the same thing. Weathering is the breakdown of rock into the sediment, and erosion is the transport of that sediment to a, excuse me, to a different location. The sediment is transported by either running water, glaciers, or wind. So first we're gonna talk about running water. Running water is the most common mode of sediment transport. Um, and with water, the more energetic, the stronger the current is, the larger the particles of sediment it can carry with it. Uh, as the water slows down and loses energy, it drops or, or larger pieces of sediment settle out of the water and are what said to be deposited. And so as the water slows down, it drops progressively smaller and smaller sediment. And so in this way, running water sorts sediment as it slows down. So it's moving really quickly. It can deposit large sediment and it keeps on carrying small sediment with it. As it slows down, it drops smaller and smaller particles of sediment. Running water is also the only way in which dissolved sediments are transported. So minerals dissolve in rock. And whenever running water transports sediment, the further the sediment is transported by the running water, the more rounded the particles of sediment become. You ever see like smooth river rocks? Those smooth river stones are, are pieces of sediment that have been transported a far distance by the water, and so they're well, they're well rounded. Excuse me. Next we have glaciers. So glaciers are, um, flowing water as well, but flowing solid water. So there are big masses of ice that flow down mountainous valleys or across um, polar landscapes. And these, these flowing masses of ice, they can, as you might imagine, just push all different sizes of sediment with them. So they move sediment of all different sizes. And whenever glaciers deposit or drop sediment, they drop 
all different sized sediment together. So the, the glacial deposits compose, are composed of all different size sediment. So very big pieces, you know, very tiny pieces are all deposited together. Lake running water, the further that glaciers transport the sediment, the more rounded it becomes. Next we have wind. So wind can only transport sediment the size of sand and smaller. Um, you know, it's, fortunately we're not there now, but I'm sure you've walked across that huge parking lot, the war campus on a windy day, because it's, well, it's always windy up there. And uh, you have a piece of dirt or something, you feel them hitting you in the face, and something gets in your eye. But um, that's the wind transporting sediment. Right. So here you can see sand being blown off Africa by a windstorm. You see this, the sand being blown off the desert of Africa over the Atlantic Ocean. And like the other two, running water and glaciers, the further that wind transports sediment, the more rounded the particles of sediment become. So whenever a sediment is deposited, um, if we look at the sorting of the sediment, we can gain some information about the process which deposited it. So sorting is how uniform the particle size of the sediment is. So very poorly sorted sediment, as you can see here, are sediment deposits where there's a wide range of sediment size. So it's very poorly sorted by size. Poorly sorted still has a, a variety of particle sizes, or, or we also, instead of particle, the common term is grain. So a grain of sediment, so a very wide variety of grain size, but not as drastic uh, as a variety as poorly sorted. Well sorted sediment has a fairly consistent size. I mean, there's some variation, but it's all within the same ballpark. And well sorted sediment is never all the grains of sediment pretty much have the same size. Right, so you know, so far in you know, what we've talked about, we come to some conclusions as to what deposited sediment based upon their sorting. For example, glaciers deposit very poorly sorted sediment. So if we see very poorly or poorly sorted sediments, it could have been by glaciers. Uh, if we see very well sorted sediment, that was could have been deposited by maybe slow moving water. Water is moving so slow that it can only transport you know, sand and mud, and the sand is settling out. So we have, um, but the mud is still being carried along the water. Or maybe it's even moving even slower, and it can only tra uh, transport mud, and that mud is settling out. So at the bottom of the riverbed, we have particles of sediment all the same size that are settling out. Okay. Or if it's very fast moving water, it can transport and deposit all different types of sediment, all different sizes of sediment. So it might be more poorly sorted. And if it's the wind, since wind can only transport size, uh, grain sizes of sand and smaller, wind usually deposits fairly well sorted sediment as well. We also can glean some information about um, the history of the sediment by looking at the angularity of the sediment. So angularity is how angular or rounded the sediment is. And so whenever sediment is weathered from bedrock, it's usually very angular, which means it has sharp edges and points. You can see here. But as it's transported further, uh, further distance by water, glaciers, or wind, those sharp and pointed edges, they get worn down, they get smoothed out. And so it becomes subangular to subrounded to eventually very well rounded. So whenever we see very angular sediment, we know that that sediment is not far from the rock it was weathered from, the bedrock it was weathered from, it hasn't been transported for a far distance. If we, if we find very well rounded sediment, that tells us that sediment has been transported a far distance from the bedrock it was weathered from. So sediment deposition um, is whenever the sediment is dropped and it's the um, well, it's deposited by either the running water glaciers or wind. And in an environment in which sediments are deposited are known as sedimentary environments. And there are a long, there's a long list of sedimentary, sedimentary environments. They include uh, glacial deposits from, you know, gl glaciers in high altitude regions. Uh, they 
include these things called alluvial fans where the fast moving water flowing down the steep slopes of the mountains. As it gets down here to the floodplain, it slows down. As it slows down, it drops the larger particles of sediment it was transporting and creates these things called alluvial fans. You have swamps, you have riverbeds, river channels, and floodplains, uh, just your typical, you know, typical beach. Um, you have reefs, organic reefs like coral reefs, river deltas, estuaries, lakes, salt flats, sand dunes, and deserts. You have the shallow sea floor, the deep sea floor. There's many, many different types of sedimentary environments. But see, what most of them have in common is water. Not all of them, but most of them, because water is the most common mode of sediment transport. Once sediment is deposited, it's not rock. It's still loose, unconsolidated sediment. So how does that sediment turn into rock? Well, that process is known as lithification. So lithification is the process by which unconsolidated sediments are transformed into solid, consolidated sedimentary rock. And lithification involves two steps. First, the sediment, once it's deposited, has to be compacted. And sediment compaction occurs by other layers of sediment being deposited on top of it. And the weight of those additional layers of sediment acting down causes the deeper layers of sediment to compact. And the, and the space, called the pore space, in between the grains of sediment is reduced as they're compacted. And once the sediment is compacted, then water seeps in through those, in between those grains of sediment, and in that water are dissolved minerals. And those dissolved minerals begin to crystallize out, or precipitate out of the water. And so mineral crystals begin to grow on the grains of sediment. And then those mineral crystals grow, and they interlock, they intergrow and interlock, and they cement the grains of sediment together. That process is known as cementation. And so common minerals that act as cements in sedimentary rocks are calcite, which is calcium carbonate, you see calcite here, silica, which is quartz, and iron oxide, which is hematite. Right? So those are common cements uh, that are minerals that cement sediments together to form sedimentary rock. So here we can see a visual. So we have this unconsolidated sediment being deposited. So here, these are the grains of sediment. Uh, the blue space is pore space, or vacant space between the grains of sediment. So then once the sediment is deposited, it is compacted due to the pressure of additional sediments deposited above. And that reduces this pore space. So we have this much larger pore space over here. And the pore space is reduced on, once it's compacted. Then after it's compacted, then the unconsolidated sediment is cemented together as minerals that are dissolved in the water precipitate out in between the grains of sediment. As mineral crystals grow, interlocking with each other and cement the grains of sediment together. In this case, this orange cement, it says here it's quartz, so it's the silica, that uh, mineral silica that's acting as the cement in this illustration. So if we look at the entire cemetery rock life cycle, first we have rock, bedrock, exposed at the surface, like here at high elevation. When this bedrock is exposed, it's weathered, mechanical or chemical weathering. And that weathering breaks the rock down into sediment. That sediment is then transported, what we call erosion, right? It's transported by running water, transported by glaciers or it's transported by the wind. Okay. So once the sediment is eroded or transported, it's then deposited. And once it's deposited, it can be lithified. And if it is lithified, it is then turned into a sedimentary rock. So the sedimentary rock life cycle is that existing rock is exposed, weathered, broken down into sediment, sediment is transported, deposited, and lithified. So there are three different types of sedimentary rocks, mainly because there's three different types of sediment. The first type of sedimentary rock I look at are those known as clastic sedimentary rocks. Uh, some texts refer to these as detrital 
sedimentary rocks. Both terms are used. Uh, but clastic sedimentary rocks are those that are made up of the grains and fragments of pre-existing rock that have been weathered out of that rock. So clastic sedimentary rocks are made up of gravel, sand, and mud. And they get their name from the Greek word clastos, which means piece or fragment. Biochemical sedimentary rocks are created from the remains of animals or plants. Most of them, not all of them, most of them are the remains of marine plankton. So little tiny organisms that live in this, in, uh, along the sea surface. They make these little tiny shells out of calcium carbonate or silica. And their shells, you know, the organisms die, they settle to the bottom of the ocean, or they accumulate, they get compacted and cemented, they get lithified into biochemical sedimentary rock. Sometimes biochemical sedimentary rocks are known as organic chemical sedimentary rocks. Um, I don't actually too much agree with that term, uh, so I like to use biochemical sedimentary rocks. And then finally, we have chemical sedimentary rocks. And chemical sedimentary rocks are those that form through an inorganic or non-biological process in which dissolved minerals in water precipitate out of water, so mineral crystals uh, they directly precipitate out of water. So say if you, you have salt water that evaporates, as that water evaporates, all the dissolved minerals in that water, they don't go with the vapor, they stay behind, and those dissolved minerals begin to crystallize out, forming mineral crystals, which uh, those mineral crystals grow together, forming a chemical sedimentary rock. So now we're going to look at some common clastic sedimentary rocks. Excuse me. So first we have a rock called conglomerate. And um, its name is very fitting because this rock is a conglomeration of all different sized sediment. So conglomerate is made up of poorly sorted sediment, which you can see, which you can see here, right? You can see that this, there we go. We can see, that you have these large grains of sediment, which in a rock they're called clasts. So you have these large clasts, and then you have these little tiny clasts, and you have these really, really tiny ones, you can't even see them, right? They're so tiny. So a wide variety of grain sizes in this rock. So poorly sorted sediment. The sediment is also well-rounded. You'll see these clasts, they have, they're not angular, they have, they're nice and rounded. Right? That tells us that this sediment is transported a far distance. So if we find conglomerate, it tells us all that maybe it was ice, a glacier, that transported this sediment and deposited, deposited sediment. Or maybe it was very fast moving water, maybe at the base of a mountain, as this water flowed at really high speeds, rushing down, you know, picture white water flowing down the side of a mountain, transporting all these different sized sediment. Never gets to the bottom of the mountain and it flattens out and slows down, drops all the sediment in one place, and then create these deposits of very poorly sorted sediment that could form a conglomerate. So when we find conglomerate, you can think like, well, what sort of environment could the, the sediment that makes up this rock have been deposited in? Or could it be in glacial environment or maybe the base of a mountain? Next is breccia. So breccia, like conglomerate, is poorly sorted. The difference is, I don't know if you can tell by looking at the image here, is that the grains of sediment are angular. They're not well-rounded like they are in conglomerate. So this tells us that the grains of sediment were transported a short distance, not a long distance. And so maybe they were likely deposited in a landslide. Right? You can imagine a landslide or this rock flows under gravity, deposited, uh, very poorly sorted, right? All different size particles, and, but transport a short distance, so everything's still rough and jagged and angular. So if that sediment can, becomes lithified, it'll form a poorly sorted plastic sedimentary rock with uh, angular grains of sediment known as breccia. Next, we have sandstone. And I wonder if you can guess what type of sediment sandstone 
is composed of. It's probably one of the hardest questions in this class, right? So obviously, if you know it's made of sand, if only all rocks could have names like this, correct? Uh, that would be nice. But um, sandstone is made up of grains of sand, and sand is deposited in a lot of different environments. So uh, to know, have an idea of what sort of sedimentary environment this sand was deposited in that's making up this rock, you have to look a little bit closer at the grains of sand. Uh, look at uh, how well they're sorted. Do we, are all the grains of sand the same size? Are some a little smaller, some a little bigger? Uh, and how well rounded are the grains of sediment? Are they well rounded or the angular? Um, so in this case, this sandstone, uh, I don't know if you can see from the image, but it's a really coarse, rough sandstone. So it, it's subangular. So it tells us that it was transported a short distance. So it could have been transported by water, but maybe the sand was likely deposited by wind. So it wasn't transported very far. So where we might find um, that cemetery, what sort of environment that cemetery rocks could suggest would be a desert. So maybe that environment was a desert in the past where that sediment was being blown by the wind and deposited. Next, a very common classic sedimentary rock is shale. Now shale is composed of mud, so lithified mud, so really tiny particles of sediment. So the sediment is well-rounded, it's transported a far distance, and it's very well sorted. So shale sometimes can be deposited by water, so very tiny particles blown by the wind, but it's usually deposited by water. And because it's really tiny particles, it's usually deposited by slow moving water. So a very slow, lazy river, or very often uh, at the bottom of a lake. So, you know, as water flows into a lake, and these rivers, it flushes all the sediment into the river, into the lake, and then the mud that's flushing slowly settles out to the bottom of the lake. Uh, or in a swamp, same thing. So you have very slow moving water where this. Uh, mud can settle out and form shale. Uh, so one example where we could find a sedimentary environment for shale is a river delta. So this is the Mississippi River, uh, Mississippi River Delta, and Mississippi River is just dumping tons of silt and mud, silt and clay, which together are called mud, sorry into the Gulf of Mexico. This is all just mud. And this layer after layer after layer of mud being deposited. And so that mud would be essentially later lithified into shale. All right, so we look here, there's four common classic sedimentary rocks we looked at. So the poorly sorted, uh, classic sedimentary rocks include conglomerate and breccia. Conglomerate have the well-rounded sediment, breccia has the angular sediment. Then the more well-rounded classic sedimentary rocks include sandstone, composed of sand, and then shale. Shale is sometimes called mudstone or siltstone, and it's composed of mud. And not all shale has fossils in it like this one does, but we often do find fossils in shale because shale forms like coastal and swampy environments where there's a lot of plants growing and the plant dies. And it gets buried by mud and then fossil forms in between those layers of mud. So like this fern fossil here, but not all shale, pieces of shale have fossils in them. So not only does the sedimentary rock give us some idea of what the environment was like in the past when that sediment was deposited, but the context of sedimentary rocks uh, in the geological sequence, uh, basically the ordering of rocks, gives us some information. So for example, in this example, we have some conglomerate with sandstone deposit on top of it, with shale deposit on top of that. So at this location, over time, it had very poorly sorted, well-rounded sediment deposited. And then later, it had more well-sorted, smaller sediment sand deposited. And then later, it had well-sorted, tiny sediment deposited mud. So what sort of environment could that have occurred in? Well, 
think of the base of a mountain. So you have you have a you know a large mountain, and then you have water flowing really quickly out of that mountain, and then it flattens out at the base of the mountain. It's just going to deposit very large, some tiny, some just poorly sorted set of, at the base of that mountain. But over time, I don't know if I can get the eraser. Oh, nope. Oh, there we go. What that? Learn something new every day. Over time, that mountain weathers away. And so it's not as steep. And so this river isn't flowing as fast anymore. And so now, at this location, the river is not traveling fast enough to transport those large particles of sediment. So it starts to deposit smaller particles, more well sorted, deposits sand. And even later on, uh, the mountain has weathered even more. And so now the water flowing here is moving even more slowly. It's moving so slow they can't even transport sand, just as mud, just a muddy river. And that mud deposits is deposited out and it's deposited over top of that sand. So at this location in this river channel, as this mountain has weathered away over the course of millions of years, many, many millions of years, different types of sediment are being deposited in that river channel, dependent on how fast the water is flowing through that channel. And the speed of the water flowing through that channel is dictated by the slope of the mountain, which got more and more gradual as the mountain weathered away. So if we see the sequence, say that could tell us that this is likely a river channel. So you can see here, we have you know, this mountainous area, and in this river channel, we have all this very poorly sorted, well-rounded sediment. What type of sediment is this going to form? Conglomerate, right? So like, where's the water? I don't see any water there. Well, notice that a lot of these stream, these uh, river valleys and these mountainous areas, uh, they don't always have water flowing through them. Uh, sometimes they go dry. But in the spring of the year, when all the snow melts, higher elevations is flowing down, it's flood. It's just the water is just raging through there. And that's whenever it transports this large sediment. This figure over here shows a river valley where you can see that it's much more um, advanced. These mountains are more advanced in their age. They've weathered down. You can see the actual soil has formed. So you have vegetation, you know, growing on them. Um, and so these slopes aren't as steep. And so the water flowing down into this river channel isn't traveling as quickly. So it can't transport. Also, you might not have snow caps. So you don't have this large release of water during the spring of the year with all the melts to create these very uh, high energetic uh, floods that, that bring this large center down here. So you just have more you know, steady, slower moving water that's able to bring sand down here, deposit sand. But what's underneath this sand is the, it's conglomerate, conglomerate that was deposited whenever these mountains were much larger, like these ones. And this was, you know, a book more similar to that. And in the future, as these mountains weather way even more, and this river will flow through here even more slowly, and it'll deposit even finer sediment, you know, deposit uh, mud. And so the conglomerate beneath the sand will form, the, sorry, the gravel beneath the sand will form conglomerate, the sand will form sandstone, and the future mud deposit on top of it will form shale. Uh, we could also get clues to what sort of environment this, the um, sediment was deposited in by uh, other markers like ripples. Okay, so here's some sandstone with these ripples in it. So this is ripples like you would see in sand on the beach or the bank of a lake or a river. And what happens is as the uh, sun dries the sand, there's minerals dissolved in the water that precipitate out and they kind of very loosely, very loosely kind of gel the sediment together. Now you can go there and you know, kick it with your foot and mess it all up, uh, but it's held together enough that next time the high tide comes in or if there's another you know, flood event where the level of the lake rises and these ripples are covered up by water, 
they're kind of held in place and a new layer of sediment is deposited on top of it. So what happens is now the boundary between those two layers of sediment has these ripples in it. And when those two layers of sediment are lithified, the ripples are preserved. All right, so something that's usually just a fleeting moment, like ripples in the sand on the beach, can sometimes be preserved in um, in the sediments, the layers of sediments, and then and then uh, memorialized in the as the sedimentary rock is lithified. So it can be captured for millions of years. Right, so a small fleeting um, you know moment of time that's you know usually fleeting these ripples because they get washed away or whatever. But, you know, they happen to get captured and preserved for millions of years in the future. So like these ripples here on this beach, left hand side. So as the next tide comes in, these ripples could be covered up, buried with more sediment, and then those layers of sediment lithify, those ripples will be preserved in the sedimentary rock. And the same is true with footprints. Like you imagine if an animal walked across here, say like a dinosaur, and it put its footprint in there, right? And those footprints or now depressions are in the sand. As the water comes in, those depressions will be filled in with sediment, and those layers of sediment get lithified, those footprints get fossilized into the layers of sediment. So next we're going to look at common biochemical sedimentary rocks. Okay. So the first we're going to look at uh, one that forms in swamps. So in a swamp, what happens is the water is stagnant, it's not moving very quickly. And, uh, and what happens whenever water is not moving is oxygen doesn't get dissolved into the water. So that's why you have the aerator in your fish tank and why they have fountains in the ponds of golf courses. It's because you have to keep on you know, moving the water around to dissolve oxygen into the water for the fish. So this stagnant water, what happens is, uh, there's no new oxygen being dissolved into it. And the microbes in the water that, that break down organic matter, so that's why organic matter decays. Why do things rot? They rot because bacteria is eating the organic matter. And like us, to eat food, you need to, to extract energy from that food, you need to react it with oxygen. So we have to breathe in oxygen, just like these bacteria. In order for them to consume the organic matter that they're breaking down, they need oxygen as well. And so in these swamps, because the water is stagnant, the, the water becomes, uh, high, uh, develops what's called hypoxia, or very low oxygen levels. And those low oxygen levels slow down the decomposition of organic matter. And so what happens is vegetation begins to accumulate at the bottom of swamps. So I don't know if you ever walked out to a, into a swamp or, or maybe like a coastal marsh on the beach here. You, know, you step in and it's like all squishy and your foot stick, sinks down. And, you know, it's at that moment if you're wearing flip-flops or water shoes, they're like, all right, yeah, it's not coming back out. And I pull my, pull my, uh, my foot back out it's gonna get stuck down there. And it's happened to me too many times, but you know, you, you just, just sinks down in there and you try to pull down into that <laughs> sucking sound as it pulled out. Well, that's all the sediment and organic matter just closing in and kind of creates a vacuum to kind of pull out and that's what pulls your shoe off. But anyways, you pull it out, you get that really dark, dark, thick stuff. Uh, and it's usually smelly. Why is it smelly? Because it's not, because it's partially rotting organic matter. That organic matter is accumulating down there. So yeah, if you ever start digging in the swamp and it starts to stink because it's you know, that organic matter has started to decompose partially, uh, it's decomposing very slowly. So what happens is, is that organic matter, that, that vegetation, it accumulates in the bottom of the swamp. Now, if that layer of vegetation, which is called peat, that, that altered, partially altered vegetation peat, that peat gets covered up by other layers of sediment and compacted, it gets turned into a rock called coal. And so, so coal is a chemical, it's, sorry, is a biochemical sedimentary rock and it's formed from the compaction of vegetation 
that is deposited in a swamp. And so that's why when you burn coal, it releases carbon dioxide because the vegetation, the big plants, took the carbon dioxide out of the air um, to, make its, to make its body, right? It takes carbon dioxide out of the air and takes sunlight and water and it makes organic molecules and makes its structure out of. Whenever that vegetation dies and it accumulates in that swamp, that carbon dioxide it took from the atmosphere is now stuck as peat. And as it gets compact and turned into coal, all that carbon is now in the coal. So if you dig up the coal and you burn it, you re-release that carbon because when you burn these carbohydrates, these organic molecules that are in the coal, you react them with oxygen, it produces carbon dioxide. So um, that's why coal is considered to be a fossil fuel because it's literally the remains of ancient organisms, vegetation in a swamp. So here you can see that the vegetation accumulating in the swamp known as peat, it gets compacted, it forms a very low grade coal called lignite. It gets compacted even more to form what's called soft coal or bituminous coal. Then if it gets squeezed by a convergent plate boundary, which you know, we'll talk about later, it can be turned into a metamorphic rock called anthracite, which is hard coal. But, so this is a metamorphic rock, anthracite, but bituminous coal is a sedimentary rock, soft coal. So the next uh, common biochemical sedimentary rock we're looking at, it forms in ocean reefs where the exoskeletons of organisms are deposited. So a lot of organisms make their exoskeletons out of a material called calcium carbonate. A calcium carbonate is a calcium atom bonded with a carbon atom and three oxygens. And so think of, you know, coral, clams, snail shells, sh shells, so snails, oysters, all of them, they make their shells and their exoskeletons out of calcium carbonate. Well, when all of those exoskeletons are deposited together, they get compacted, they lithify to form a biochemical sedimentary rock called limestone. Now this is called fossiliferous limestone because it's fossil bearing. You can see, you know, these snail shells, snail shells, in there and some there's a clam shell so you can see these from fossils in it. So this is fossiliferous limestone. But most limestone is actually made up of the exoskeletons of much smaller organisms, little tiny phytoplankton, photosynthetic plankton that live in the ocean um, and along the sea surface. And never those organisms die, they're calcium carbonate exoskeletons settle and accumulate on the seafloor. Now a clam shell is white, right? Because calcium you know, oyster shell is kind of white too, because um, calcium carbonate is white. So whenever this calcium carbonate, these calcium carbonate shells accumulate on the seafloor, they form this white material. It's called calcareous ooze. And so we usually find this calcareous ooze on relatively shallow seafloors. I don't mean by shallow as in like you can wade through it, it's knee deep or waist deep, it's shallow as in it's not, you know, many kilometers deep. So usually shallower than what, 4,500 meters or four, four and a half kilometers. So sea floor that's shallower than four and a half kilometers, we often find this calcareous ooze deposited on. Now, so this is the little tiny phyto, uh, you know, exoskeletons of, the, of phytoplankton that accumulate in the seafloor. Now, if this calcareous ooze is compacted and lithified, it forms non-fossiliferous non limestone. Now, this is called non-fossiliferous limestone because you cannot see the fossils because the structures are so small. But if you look under a microscope, you can actually see little tiny structures. But so, we usually just call this limestone. We drop the non-fossiliferous because it's the most common type. And in this picture here, we have what are called the white chalk cliffs of Dover. So the chalk cliffs of Dover, because well, it look, kind of looks like chalk, it's white, right? Well, because chalk is calcium carbonate, chalk is limestone. So they crush up limestone, they pack it into a cylinder, and there you go, you have chalk. 
Um, so this was a shallow sea floor. And all this was that calcareous ooze. It was phytoplankton that were deposited on the sea floor. Um, and what else are I gonna say? Oh, we find, we use limestone in a lot of different things. So we uh, ever eat a tum, like you have indigestion, it makes it kind of taste chalky. Well, that's because tums are, you guessed it, calcium carbonate. They just flavor them, so they're not so bad. Uh, we also put some calcium carbonate in toothpaste to make it white and so forth. So, oh, and we also crush up limestone to make cement. So cement is crushed limestone. So it's the little tiny exoskeletons fossilized and uh, lithified exoskeletons of phytoplankton that lived in the ocean a long time ago. So we found that calcareous ooze, which forms limestone on the shallow sea floors. Right? But on the deeper, the colder, deeper sea floors, now a different type of biochemical sediment accumulates because in those deeper sea floors, the water is cooler. And if you remember when we talk about volcanism, the cooler liquid is, the more gas can be dissolved in it. Excuse me one second. Her. She had the hiccups. So let's make sure she's okay. But maybe she can say hi. A little break from sedimentary rocks. Say hi. Okay, poor thing. She has the hiccups. But, and the, as I was saying, the cooler the liquid is, the higher the gas solubility, the more gas can be dissolved in it. So, in really cooled water on the deep sea floor, and actually in the polar parts of the ocean, like near the North Pole and the South Pole, around Antarctica, uh, there's a lot of carbon dioxide dissolved in the water because of low temperatures and high gas, gas solubility. When we dissolve carbon dioxide in water, it makes the water more acidic. So if you ever measure the pH of seltzer, like this right here, it has the same pH as lemon juice, same acidity as lemon juice from the carbonic acid formed by the carbon dioxide dissolved in the water. Now those, um, the water is acidic enough that the calcium carbonate is dissolved back into the water. And so it can't accumulate. So that calcareous ooze dissolves back into the water. But this type of ooze, it's siliceous ooze. So there's another type of phytoplankton that live in the ocean. And they make their exoskeletons out of this stuff look familiar that is silica the same stuff that quartz is made up of right and it does not dissolve as easily back into water so these phytoplankton that make their exoskeletons out of silica those exoskeletons accumulate in larger abundances on the cold deep sea floors and the cold polar sea floors whenever this siliceous ooze is compacted and solidified it forms the um, marine biochemical, marine is in, in the ocean, limestone is a marine rock too, marine biochemical sedimentary rock, chert. Now chert like obsidian has this property where it fractures in these smooth surfaces, so it's also a, a common stone to make serrated edges like in this arrowhead. But if we find chert somewhere that tells us, oh this was a very cold ocean floor at one point in time, whether it was a very deep sea floor or it was uh, in the polar, polar sea floor. What about a shelly beach? I don't know if you guys have ever come across a beach like this where there's no, you can't even see the sand, it's just covered with seashells, snail shells and clam shells. Well, all these shells, if they get buried by their sediment, they get compacted and cemented and they were lithified into a sedimentary rock. And that forms coquina. So you can see in coquina, you have all these little tiny shell fragments because as the shells are compacted, they get broken into pieces. And these little tiny shell fragments, I don't know if you can see, but these are quartz crystals. So they're cemented together by quartz, okay? So, uh, and so that makes this a biochemical sedimentary rock because it's made up of 
the fragments of shells. So it's mostly calcium carbonate. Those are common biochemical sedimentary rocks. We're going to look at some common chemical sedimentary rocks. So deserts are where a lot of chemical sedimentary rocks are formed. And they form uh, in deserts because we have water evaporating. And as that water evaporates, the dissolved minerals are left behind. The dissolved minerals such as sodium chloride, halite, or calcium carbonate, calcite. So you know, calcium carbonate is like, wait, isn't that limestone? It is limestone, right? Calcium carbonate. But limestone is biochemical, which means it forms whenever organisms like a, like a clam takes the calcium and the carbonate out of the water, puts it together, and secretes it as a shell. And then that shell is deposited and compacted and lithified into a sedimentary rock. Because of that biological process, that calcium carbonate was removed from the water by an organism. And so it makes it biochemical. Where a chemical sedimentary rock is never the calcium and the carbonate that are in the water just bond on their own and precipitate and form a mineral crystal on their own um, and precipitate out. So there's no biological process. So that's why it's not a biochemical sedimentary rock, just a chemical sedimentary rock. So they're both the same materials, limestone. And not, which is a biochemical sedimentary rock, and calcite, which is a chemical sedimentary rock. But these are often referred to as evaporites because they form from the evaporation of water. And halite and calcite are some of the most common ones. This is actually a salt mine. So the floor is salt, the walls are salt, and the ceiling is salt. So this was an ancient uh, sea. And as it evaporated, all the dissolved salts were precipitated out and form these layers of chemical sedimentary rocks. Now, and I'll see this in one of our labs. As, um, as water evaporates, different dissolved salts, so salt is any inorganic solid dissolved in water, but any uh, halite and calcite are both considered salts. There's other salts too, like um, Epsom salts, that's magnesium sulfate, and there's other salts. Um, they, depending on how soluble they are, how easily to dissolve in water, they precipitate out at different times. Um, and so because they precipitate out at different times, they layer on top of each other. So I'm looking from sedimentary rock. So usually sedimentary rock is found in layers, especially plastic, but most sedimentary rock is found in layers because sediment is usually deposited in layers because most sediment is deposited by water, and how does water, how does sediment settle out of, out of water? It's flat layers, right? You have a bucket of, of water, you put a bunch of sand and mud in here. As that sand and mud settles out, it settles out as a flat layer at the bottom of the bucket, right? So here, if we look at the Grand Canyon, we can see that it has all these different layers of sedimentary rock. So these are all sediments that were deposited on a seafloor. So this is a seafloor for many hundreds of millions of years and layer after layer after layer of sediment was deposited. And they got compacted and, lit and uh, cemented and therefore lithified into these different layers of sedimentary rock that are now exposed by the Colorado River eroding, uh, weathering and uh, eroding the rock away. But here this helps guide your eye. You can see these different layers. So that's a layer and layer. And we call these rock layers, we call them beds. So that's where the term bedrock comes from. It's rock that's still in the bed, right? So bedrock is rock that's still in the bed. So these different layers of rock. And so oh, I want to note that the, you can see that these layers are all pretty much parallel, they're horizontal and parallel, because that's how sediment is deposited. But sometimes we have layers uh, that are not horizontal and parallel like these cross beds. Here you can see this guides your eye. You have this bedding plane, right? Then you have this bedding plane, then you have bedding planes that are cutting across it. So they're not parallel. This forms uh, where the wind is creating sand dunes. Because what happens is the wind blows the sand up the dune, then the sand is dropped down. And you have another la uh, layer of sand deposited. So that creates a bedding plane between this deposition of sand and this, this the, the deposit that occurred earlier. 
then you know more sand will be blown up and deposited and create another bedding plane. So we have these these bedding planes within the dune. So you can say this um, intra dune bedding, and then you have uh, new dunes start to form on top of other dunes, and so that creates bedding in between dunes. This inter dune bedding. They have these beds that cross each other. So the beds between dunes and the beds in, uh, inside of dunes forms that cross bedding. So now we're going to look at how marine sedimentary rocks, sedimentary rocks deposited um, in the ocean or the, or the coastal areas, are deposited in an episode of marine transgression. Now what that term means, marine transgression, is a period of rising sea levels. Okay. As the sea, okay, so I'm a little ahead of myself. So if we look at the coastline, what set, type of sediment is deposited right at the coastline? Well, when you go to the beach, what are you laying on? You're laying on sand, right? So sand is deposited at, along, along most coastlines. And so we're, this sand is coming from land. So it's sediment being washed into the ocean from land and the, it settles out of the water and is deposited. The smaller sediment, the mud, it gets transported further out into the water before it settles out. So eventually all the sand settles out and further out, all the mud settles out. So you have deposits of so you have a sandy seafloor that transitions into a muddy seafloor. And once you get out here, all the land-derived sediment, sand and mud, have already settled to the seafloor. So the only source of sediment out here is that coming from the organisms on the surface of the water. And they die and their exoskeletons sink and settle on the seafloor, forming that calcareous ooze. So the sediment deposition from the coastline moving out to sea goes sand, mud, calcareous ooze, which lithify to form sandstone, shale, and limestone, respectively. Now what happens whenever the sea level rises? Well, that pattern moves inland with the rising sea. So as the sea level rises, now we have sand, so the, you know, this was the seafloor. So this dashed line represents the former seafloor. As the sea level rises, sand is deposited further inland, this mud is deposited further inland, and then the limestone is deposited further inland. And as the sea levels rise even more, that pattern of the sediment moves inland with it as well. So you can see at this location, if we had drilled down through this rock, we would find limestone above shale, above sandstone. So you see the sandstone is deposited in the shallowest water, mud a little bit deeper, closer, uh, so yeah, sorry, sand is deposited in the shallowest water closest to shore, mud in a little deeper water, a little further from shore, and limestone is deposited in deeper water that's offshore. And so this tells us that over time, these sediments are deposited in shallow coastal waters, a little bit deeper, further offshore waters, and then uh, even deeper offshore waters. So at this location, the sea level must have risen over time. So if we see this pattern of going from bottom to top, sandstone, shale, limestone, that tells us that this was an ancient coastline along which sea levels had risen. Okay. Marine, sorry, marine regression is the opposite where we have falling sea levels and the pattern just goes in the opposite direction. As sea levels fall, oh, that's marine regression. As sea levels fall, so here we have this sand, mud, and limestone. As sea level falls, that pattern of deposition moves seaward uh, uh, with the retreating coastline. And so if you would drill down through these layers, you would find sandstone above shale, whoops, above whoops, limestone. So this tells us that over time, the sediments were deposited in deep offshore waters, you know, shallower, you know, not as far offshore waters, and then extremely shallow, 
near uh, near coastal waters or along the coast. And so here, over time, the sea level dislocation has fallen. So this was falling sea levels. And when we see this in uh, the you know geologic section, so we have outcrops of sedimentary rock, we can see this cycling of non-marine, so terrestrial sediments, sediments that are deposited on land. And so it was above sea level. We have this layer of coal, and it was a coastal swamp, right? It had coal deposited. And after the coal, we have marine sediments, so sediments that are deposited in the sea floor. And one of the, way we, one of the ways we know that they're marine is that because we find marine fossils in them. So organisms, fossils of organisms in the ocean. So we have terrestrial or, or sediments, sediments are deposited above sea level, a coastal swamp, a marsh, coal, and then marine, shallow marine sediments. And then above that, we have deep marine sediments and limestone with, with offshore and river fossils. So this location, it was first above sea level, at sea level, just below sea level, even further below sea level. So this shows an episode of marine transgression where it went from being above sea level, terrestrial sedimentation, at sea level, coal forming swamp, just beneath the sea level, near shore, and further offshore and further below sea, uh, sea level. And then you see the pattern reverses itself, where you go to uh, non marine shells. So we're back to being above sea level, which tells us that sea levels must have been fallen, gone through a period of regression. Now, why don't we see the near shore sediments and the coal? Here, it goes right from the kind of limestone to the terrestrial sedimentation, because those might have existed, but when it's above sea level, it could be eroded. So some of this rock might have been re removed from erosion, which we'll talk about later. So these are called cyclothems. This repetitive pattern in the, in the sedimentary rocks of rising and then falling sea levels. And why these are important, well, I can see, there's another example here. Here you have a coastal swamp where this peat is being deposited. Here you have above sea level, so these are terrestrial sediments. And this is below sea level, so these are marine sediments. And as the sea level rises, this pattern of sediment deposition moves inland, where now this peat will be covered as sea levels rise by marine sedimentary rocks. And these terrestrial sedimentary rocks, as the cold moving swamp moves back, will be covered by peat. So this pattern just continues up, you know, as the sea level rises. So these coastal swamps, they're very dense um, swamps. They usually form in tropical regions, so like, like this one here. Thank you. This is the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. But I think the Bayou of Louisiana or the Everglades of Florida, that's these cool forming swamps. Um, and why this is important is because whenever we see these cyclothems, like this one, this illustration, the non-marine sediments, coal, shallow marine, deep marine, back to non-marine, coal, shallow marine, deep marine, shallow marine, back to non-marine, we see these re re repetitive episodes of transgressing, rising sea levels, regressing, falling sea levels. Trans uh, rising sea levels, falling sea levels. See, so we see that changes in sea level are very common on Earth. Actually, the sea level is pretty much always changing. The question is, is what causes a change in sea level? Well, it's usually changes in Earth's climate, right? So if you think about it, what happens is if the Earth is cold, then never snow falls on land. All the snow that melts uh, all the snow that falls during the summer, uh, blah, sorry, um, all, the, all the snow that falls during the winter doesn't all melt during the summer. So year after year, you have a net accumulation of snow, and that snow builds up and it compacts and forms ice, we know as glaciers. So all that water that is now stuck on land in the form of a glacier, where did it come from? Well, it came from water evaporating off the ocean. So water evaporates from the ocean, 
It falls as precipitation over land, it gets stuck there. Remember, the planet is cold as ice. And so because all this water is on land, in the form of glaciers, it's not in the ocean. So there's less water in the ocean, so you have lower sea levels. As the climate warms, those glaciers start to melt. And where does the meltwater go? It flows back into the ocean. And so over time, more and more water is added to the ocean and sea levels rise. So seeing in the geological record of sedimentary rocks rising and falling sea levels, we can see evidence of warming and cooling in Earth's climate. And it shows us that Earth's climate is always changing. It's always changing, which isn't that surprising considering that everything on Earth is always changing, right? You know, the plates are always moving. You know, there's all this stuff going on. Life is always evolving. So why wouldn't the climate always be changing too? So uh, Earth's climate changing is no new news, right? So why is everyone all up and arms about climate change, uh, global warming, if it's something that's common? Well, um, it's because quite frankly, it's the rate of the warming. So we can see from the geological record, you know, warming and cooling due to natural phenomenon, like uh, our distance between us and the sun changes, the tilt Earth's rotational axis, um, how active the sun is, all those things influence the climate, the position of the continents as they change by tectonics. So those are all natural causes of changes in climate. And, uh, but we see how life reacts to those changes in climate because uh, from the fossil record. And we see that if the climate warms too quickly, that the fossils disappear. What that means is a mass extinction. So very rapid warming means a very rapid change in the environment, fast enough that organisms can adapt, they go extinct. And so that's what's happening today, that's the concern. So the thing is, we don't have to wonder what the rapid warming is going to do because we know what it does. We know how life responds. It causes mass extinctions. We know this from the geologic record. So I like to end the lecture on sedimentary rocks by uh, talking about Mount Everest. Now we know Mount Everest is the highest, is the highest point above sea level, but at the top of Mount Everest is limestone. Now we know that limestone is a marine sedimentary rock. It forms from the remains of phytoplankton accumulating on the sea floor. Um, and that, and uh, so that limestone is 200 million years old. And so how is there a marine sedimentary rock, a rock that forms on a shallow seafloor at the top of Mount Everest? Well, it could be maybe potentially both people have thought of three different answers, right? Maybe 200 million years ago, the Himalayas did not exist. That's answer A. B, the ocean level 200 million years ago is much higher than today. So maybe that point was below sea level or C, there was a high altitude lake in the Himalayas. Well, it's not B because we would find 200 million year old marine sedimentary rocks everywhere because if Mount Everest is underwater then everything is underwater. And we don't find that. We find 200 million year old sedimentary rocks that are terrestrial rocks. They're deposited on land. And there couldn't be a high altitude lake because there are no high, high altitude lakes. It's so cold up there, it would be a block of ice. So the answer is A. So remember, in my Everest is in the Himalayas, it's formed by India colliding with Eurasia. And so be, be, before India collided with Eurasia, there was an ocean between them. And on that seafloor, limestone formed. And as that seafloor was subducting under Eurasia, some of that limestone got scraped up onto the overriding plate. And as India collided with it, forming the mountains, some of that limestone got thrusted up with the, with the growing mountains. And some of the limestone is now perched at the highest point above elevation. But I think this is just an amazing example that shows how dynamic the earth is. That a rock that forms on a shallow sea floor is now positioned at the highest point above sea level. And we did not, we were not able to explain that before uh, we understood plate tectonics. So 50 years ago, we didn't know the answer to that question. But it is amazing how dynamic the earth is and how much it can change. Even though it goes so slow, we can't notice it. It is always changing at a very slow but steady rate that over the millennia, 
it results in very drastic changes like limestone at the top of Mount Everest.